sports and but before we get to any explosive sports content this week we obviously have a new friend here on the set of ohio sports zone i want to introduce you all out there in Macland to max myerson Thank you very much. It's good to be here, and I'm looking forward to sharing some Ohio sports with you all. So, a little bit about you. You came from, you came from BG. You're formerly a Falcon. Yes, this is true. How'd you end up here? Uh, you know, I visited Ohio one time with my friends, and I just loved it, man. And it, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad not to be a part of the BG Falcons anymore. I'm truly a Bobcat, and I bought into the culture, man. I'm ready to talk about some sports. So that is all certainly good news. Bowling Green got thumped last week in football 63 <laughs> to 17 i believe but a got team that's in time yeah got yeah in time. yeah it's i think it's because you left yes i don't think that's any that's coincidence right. i don't yes. think that's that's any coincidence at all but another team that was on the thump ing side of things was ohio a huge 58 to 42 win and my god the story of this game their defense is absolutely atrocious still consistently week after week after week we are talking about how this defense is exposed particularly the secondary this is a defense max that allowed 451 yards uh, 410 of those yards through the air we got to see this one from the sideline firsthand what did you see from the defense that went so wrong? Well, you said it yourself. We gave up 450 yards, and 410 of them came through the air. Yeah. So clearly the secondary is an issue right now. I mean, the run defense was solid. They actually outgained UMass 394-41 to 41 on the ground. So, I mean, when you're winning like that, you're going to play all right. But this secondary and this pass defense needs to improve if we're going to compete to get in the MAC championship. And – I think that was really good to see that the run game was established. That really helps Nathan Rourke, um open up that zone read that they've been grown so accustomed to over his little over a full season here. And to see A.J. Oleka go and to see Malik Irons get in the, t- get in the end zone with two touchdowns. We know he uh, back with the team now after uh, some off-the-field issues last year. To see him finally have another productive game that we saw him have in the 2016 season. So establishing that run game, very important for Ohio. And I want to go back to that secondary, though, because really defensively this was a story of the game. Ohio put up 58. This is a game that they really should have, should have dominated, and we talked about that last week on Ohio Sports End. But it's the same guys week after week in the secondary. It's Jalen Fox getting burnt for the first touchdown of the game, had a one-on-one, just fell down and lost his positioning. It's guys you wouldn't expect, safeties in particular, guys like Kylan Nelson and Javon Hagan who are studs on this team. They ha- they do make good plays, but consistently the ball is getting behind them. Consistently they're getting burnt for big plays over the middle, just missed assignments. Guys like Jamal Hudson as well. It's just week after week. And Ohio, they're not, like like you just mentioned, they're going to have a hard time winning the MAC. Um, well, certainly. I mean, right now uh, their offense is definitely there. It's there. They've scored 30 points in every game, but unfortunately they've also given up 30 points in every game. So the defense is definitely very suspect right now, and that secondary is very suspect. A little more statistic evaluations for the Hunter Green and White's defense. They're giving up 518 yards per game. That is the fifth worst in the country. They're giving up the second most pass yards per game at 386 and the 15th most points per game and 38.6. And quite frankly, you knew that there was going to be some changes on the defense this year with Chad Moore and Quinton Poling leaving and, and some other – people graduating from the defensive line but i think it is a shock i think it is a shock to the players i think it is a shock to the coaching staff and it is certainly a shock for the talking heads guys like me and you who sit here and talk about this team and write about this team week in and week out how bad quite frankly to be as blunt as possible this defense has looked in the early part of the season definitely that's definitely been a negative but it wasn't all bad no the Buckeyes on saturday they did get the win they did put up 58 points and uh, nathan rorick he looked pretty good. I mean, early on, he threw a pick six, put him down 14 nothing. but he, he came back. He looked steady the rest of the way. He finished 23 for 32 from the air, 270 yards, three touchdowns. Also added 16 carries for 189 yards on the ground and a touchdown. And right now, he's doing it all for the Buc- or for the Bobcats. Bobcats. And they're currently – Bobcats. Uh, yeah, the Bobcats. Uh, they're, I mean, he's currently their leading rusher right now at yeah. quarterback. So he's really improved, and he's shown that he can carry this offense. Yeah, and it's really interesting to see how Nathan Rourke runs week after week. And 
you would think a quarterback's going to get down. He's going to slide. Nathan Rourke is going right at mm-hmm. people. He's rarely looking to duck out of bounds. He's a guy who, at the same time, with that ability to run downhill and really fight for the extra yards, put on that extra move, he's a guy who runs smart. He doesn't take a lot of damage. Mm-hmm. And give a lot of credit to his offensive line, too. And we've talked about his rushing ability. Uh, besides that one bad interception he threw, which looks like just a misran route or some sort of major communication that was returned for a touchdown and to saw Ohio go down 14 to nothing. He threw for 270 yards and three touchdowns. Really, last year, the arm, you could tell it was developing. It was part of his game, certainly. But more of a run for his quarterback. This year, Nathan Work is really coming into his own and really looking comfortable throwing the ball back there. And I think... That's in part you have two get two receivers. You played a good game this week. You have Andrew Meyer played a good game. Poppy White caught two touchdowns, I believe, had a good game. And a lot of it goes to his offensive line too. I know it's UMass and mm-hmm. opponent obviously um, had a suspect defense themselves, but really some good pass protection this week for Mr. Rourke back there. Yeah, he definitely had all the time in the world for a guy. He's not a, for a guy who runs a lot. He's not a very big guy. No, but he's he's agile. He moves well. Uh, he sees the pocket really well. And you're right, he looks more comfortable in the offense this year. His arm looks stronger, looks more accurate, and just overall looks more comfortable. And a lot of it is due to that offensive line playing well, giving him enough time to re- make reads and, and do all the things they need to do and lead this Ohio Bobcats offense. And as we move forward, one more thing I want to bring up before we move off of UMass and move into the Kent State preview is what Mark Whipple said after the game. We usually stick to what happens between the boundaries and what happens on the ice, on the playing surface in this. But this is just so mind-numbingly stupid from Mark Whipple that we just have to bring it up. I'm going to read you the exact quote. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to read you this quote. This isn't me who said this, okay? This is Mark Whipple being asked about the second half. He said, quote, Our guys played hard. They have a good team talking about Ohio. I thought it was the Mac getting their revenge on us, officiating-wise. The worst I've ever been a part of. I've been in the SEC. I've been in the NFL. I've never seen anything so bad. Six holds against none until the end. At least when I got a 15-yarder, the guy finally threw a flag. I thought our guys fought hard at the end there. We couldn't make enough plays. We had a chance there down 16 at the end, and they rape us. And he picks up the flag, so our guys fought. They have a good team, and they were home. I thought our guys were certainly ready to play because we went up 14 nothing. We just have to get ready for next week. We didn't make enough plays to beat a team like that. To say that, as sexual assault is just plastering the news, and it is certainly a problem here on campus, and I don't expect Mark Whipple to know that, and I, I, don't, think he sh- I don't think he should have to know and that's no excuse. the news story. It's certainly not. You can't bring up something like that with what's going on right now with our government, what's happening on campus, obviously. Yeah. It's just a bad thing that we can't that we can't be throwing around words like that. No, and for you to be a leader of a college football team, a big time college football team, and to go out there and say that, I get you're frustrated. I get you're pissed about the refs. I was pissed about the refs on Sunday. I think they cost the Browns a game, but that's not the point. For you to go up there and be so willfully stupid and be in charge of a college football program is just it's embarrassing. Not only to UMass and their athletic department, but really. Um, to college football at a whole sometimes. So Mark Whipple rightfully served given a one-game suspension. Mm-hmm. Could make an argument that it should be more, certainly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, just the way he threw it out there. I mean, he just continued on like he didn't say anything. And that's the kind of behavior that it's not acceptable anymore. And we, we can't have that, especially as a man who's a leader of men, a leader of, you know, how many students, how many employees talking like that. You, that's a guy who's in front of the media. What's he saying behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that we got to avoid with uh, leaders in this country. Yeah, it was certainly um, certainly embarrassing, to mm-hmm. say the least. Moving on to bigger and better things. Ohio on the road this week against Kent State. Last time they went up to Kent State, it was a grinded-out football game, a defensive war. Quinton Poling made a huge tackle. Uh, I believe Ohio won that game 10-6. to I know it was a one-possession game. Quinton Poling made a huge stop on the Ohio goal line to prevent Kent State from going up and winning that one. But Kent State, one of the few defenses who statistically has been worse than Ohio so far this year to the quarter point of the season. Do you see another shootout on the horizon? 
Well, we're certainly not going to see another 10-6 to 6 game. We're no. not, the, these offenses are, are better, and the, clearly the defenses are worse. So uh, I do not expect it to be another grinded-out game. I do expect another shootout, and hopefully one that also goes away for the Bobcats. Yeah, and I think there's really two main players that if Ohio stops, they should have their way with the Golden Flashes. One of them is Justin Rankin. He's the running back. Uh, having a pretty good season, 373 yards, 5.3 yards per carry, three touchdowns through the first four games. And don't forget that Kent State has played some really good teams. They've played Illinois, who not that good, but a Power 5 team, went on the road to Penn State and on the road to Ole Miss. So you talk about murder's row for a yeah. MAC team. So being able to rack up those stats in situations where you're going to find yourselves down, particularly at Penn State and uh, at Ole Miss, they ended up losing the Ole Miss game 38-17, but we're down for a majority of the second half. So mm. to rack up 373 yards and three touchdowns may not sound that impressive, but considering the type of game situations they're in, it is a pretty good start for Mr. Rankin. Absolutely. And uh, as you, as we were talking about earlier, the run defense was was pretty good against UMass, yeah. only giving up 41 yards. So holding him in check could definitely be a major key to the game for the Bobcats. And Ohio has to start making tackles. I was re-watching the game. And just in the first quarter, I had a tally going of seven missed tackles. I mean, it's really just responsible football. It's not hard to wrap your guy up. Mm-hmm. And it's it's rare that we see these things from a Frank Solich team, you know, this this undisciplined, these missing assignments on defense. It's really – I really am not sure why. And I don't – like kind of back to my earlier point, I don't know if anyone knows why the defense is playing with Yeah, it, it seems kind of almost to be like a lack in concentration. I yeah. Mean, I mean, there's, there's some plays that we saw – uh, in the end zone where the ball was floated in the air. Yeah. And every time it was coming down UMass's way, our, our secondary, they just can't locate the ball. They're having trouble keeping up with receivers. It, it's just a lack of concentration right now. And uh, now that we're entering MAC conference play, it's, it's time to start picking it up and start focusing on defense. Definitely. And Woody Barrett, Kent State quarterback, guy is pretty average uh, mid-American conference quarterback. Certainly someone that Ohio should have their way with. But as we've seen in the past, Ohio has made pretty much every quarterback they've played look like a star. A bit of statistics on Barrett. A completion percentage just under 60%. 228 yards per game. Five touchdowns, five interceptions. Also has 161 yards rushing. So guy who, if given the opportunity, will leave the pocket and use his legs. But we'll get back to football at the end. I want to have you talked a little bit about what's going on with the volleyball team this week? Well, uh, volleyball, they won on Sunday uh, to improve to 8-9, and 3-1 in the MAC conference. Uh, they swept Akron in three sets, 25-21, 25-14, 25-22. Uh, notable performances, Lizzie Stevens had a team-high 10 kills on 30 attempts for a three, 367 hitting percentage, uh, led Bobcats, also uh, included three aces. And uh, Vera Giocamazzi uh, registered a match high 26 assists. And so it was a great uh, weekend there for the women's volleyball team. And they're looking forward to traveling on the road to take on Miami Redhawks. Miami, got to win those games. Always fun to beat those kids in Oxford. <laughs> uh, moving on to another sport that is near and oh so dear to my heart is field hockey, who is 4 and 5, 2 and 0 oh in the MAC, one of two. Remaining undefeated teams in the Mid-American Conference, along with Miami, who was 3-0 in the conference. They did take a loss on the chin last week after Lee Warren got the first goal of the game for Ohio in the first five minutes of the second half. Drexel would go back and score four unanswered goals to make it a 5-1 to one game. Puck Thuisen had a goal and an assist for Drexel this past week. She was the top performer for the Bulldogs. Field hockey will be on the road at Ball State this Friday. So tomorrow, if you're looking for something to do, head on out to Muncie and watch some field hockey. Ball State is 1-10. Their one win did come in the Mid-American Conference. They have the worst scoring differential in the MAC on average. They're losing by about 3.53 goals per game. They give up a lot of opportunities. But they do have a more than competent goaltender and Grace Chavez, who leads the Mid-American Conference in saves per game with 7.70. And on Sunday, they will go to that school up north, play at Ohio State, who is number 25 in the National Field Hockey Coaches Poll. 
How big of a win would that be for the field hockey team to go up there and take it to Brutus, the <laughs> gals? Another uh, note for field hockey, something that would really change the season is if they would get Kendall Ballard back. Kendall Ballard, no doubt the most valuable player on the Ohio field hockey team over the last couple of years, has still yet to play this season. Uh, undisclosed reasons, undisclosed circumstances surrounding that situation, but certainly you got to hope they get Kendall Ballard back sooner than later. That would really change things. But early in the season, it looked like they were in for another long season. But Allie Johnstone, give her a lot of credit. I know they took a pretty bad loss this past week, but more uh, a really good opportunity to start at 3-0 and in the MAC against a bad Ball State team this weekend and go up and get a signature win against Ohio State and Columbus on Sunday. So field hockey trending in the right direction, something that uh, we have not talked a lot about here on Ohio Sports Center over the last two years. The field hockey kind of in a rebuilding stage, but appears to be ahead of schedule, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on from field hockey to another sport that is played with long sticks. Oh. Golf had some news this week. I understand – Someone had a pretty impressive round. Oh, very impressive. Zach yeah. Crawford, uh, unbelievable, won the Firestone Country Club Invitational, shooting a three-day total of 206, 10 under uh, during the, on the north course of Firestone. I've played the north course of Firestone. If you shoot under 70 three days in a row there, that is incredibly impressive. What did you shoot? <laughs> I shot an 81. Did, did you really? I, I couldn't quite break. You shot an 81? I couldn't quite get into the 70s. I thought I played well. But apparently, I'm nothing compared to Zach Crawford because that's really unbelievable. 81. We got ourselves a golfer here. Uh, <laughs> but Zach Crawford, 206, 10 under in the three day tournament, won the whole dang thing. Uh, the team finished tied for third uh, with a total score of 859, five under, uh, top of Eastern Michigan. So Zach Crawford leading this team, you know, it's, it's nice to see that the club sport's going to be able to compete with some of the best, to have an elite player like Zach Crawford on their team as they look forward to uh, pl- going to West Virginia next weekend to play the Pete Dye Golf Club during the Health Plan Mountaineer Invitational. So uh, that's going to be look forward to seeing what Zach can do there. Yeah, and I've talked to a couple of golfers on the, the U men's golf team and, you know, collegiate golf team, not the club team. And they're, they're really impressed by Zach Crawford. I mean, like you said, that is not an easy course to play. And to go up there and to dominate and consistently dunk all over this mm-hmm. course is very impressive. I mean, I talked to a guy this morning. I'm not going to say his name just because, you know, it's, it's he had some pretty lo- lo- yes lofty expectations for Zach. But I asked him, you know, would you be surprised if this kid can turn his, his, his you know, playing professional golf into a career? He said, no, I wouldn't be. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, I, if he ended up on the tour. Granted, you know, a lot of things have to break the right way for that. But, you know, if you have the talent, like Kevin Garnett, anything is possible. <laughs> My God. Yeah, certainly. And, uh, you know, uh, shooting a 10 under in three days, uh, Firestone South, as we all know, is the course that Tiger Woods has won eight times on. And uh, I know many people who are members of Firestone Country Club who say the North course is actually harder than the South course. So to do that is incredibly impressive. We're definitely looking forward to see what he's going to do in the future. From one club sport to another, the hockey team after a successful weekend against John Carroll, Absolutely destroying them by a final score of 11 to 4 on Saturday night and 10 to nothing last Friday. Welcomes in West Virginia Friday night for the first game of a home and home. A lot of Bobcats with very dominant weekend last weekend, as you might imagine. Captain Cody Black had two goals, six assists for eight points to lead the team just in two games. Absolutely ridiculous. Austin Heakins returned to the team after a year off. Looked very good on the penalty kill. Also notched three goals and four assists. No big deal. Tyler Harkins threw in a hat trick in game one of last weekend's double header. He had three goals and four assists as well. Matt Rudin had a hat trick in the second game, the Saturday night game. Something interesting about a Science Bird Arena for the people who haven't been there this year is that there is a new protective netting that surrounds the whole ice surface. So when people score a hat trick, there's simply no hats that come down. <laughs> I get it. It's a safety thing, but, you know, I would like to see some hats on the ice if there's three goals being scored. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I totally get it. I totally get you it. You know what I'm saying? All right. Jake Houston added two goals and 
five assists. He was a seven-point man over the last weekend. He was a plus at nine in the plus-minus statistic as well. Absolutely ridiculous. And Ohio welcoming in certainly some better competition this weekend in West Virginia. They are 2-0 and 1. Their leading scorer is J.P. Sawyer, who has four goals and two assists, good for six points in three games. So Ohio welcomes in the Mountaineers, their first test of the season. A lot of these new guys, this is the first team they're going to play where they're competent and they're able to you know go out there and play competitive for 60 minutes. Really the problem with the John Carroll game last weekend, it was, just, it was, it was one period that got away from the first game. It was the first period where Ohio dropped seven on him. Second game, it was the second period where Ohio dropped eight on the blue streaks. But this weekend, going to have to be much more prepared, play a full 60 minutes of hockey against West Virginia. Want to get out of here with some more football and then tell you who to bet your house on this weekend moving forward. My new and improved Mid-American Conference power rankings. Number one, Northern Illinois coming off of a three-overtime win on the road at Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan is a lot better than I thought they were. Um, They're not like the Bears. They are not who I thought they were. (laughs) Number two, Buffalo. Coming off a tough 42-13 loss against Army at home, Buffalo was. Army took Oklahoma into overtime. Army might legitimately have a good football team. They might be, you know, one of those group of five teams. Army's a tough team for anybody to go up against. The the way they play, it's going to be a grinded out game for any team that they go up against, certainly. That triple option. I mean, you know it's coming. Yeah. But it's unstoppable. (laughs) Just ridiculous. I mean, that really speaks to their execution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number three, Akron. They were off last week, but impressed with, with, with what they've been able to do so far. Number four, Eastern Michigan. Pushing Northern Illinois to the brink. Eastern Michigan a lot better on defense this year. Number five, Toledo got beat down on the road against Fresno State last week. They're 2-2, two and two, but they have two pretty quality losses to Fresno State and Miami. I have Ohio at six, and quite frankly, I don't think I'm going to put them any higher unless they get a quality win. They start winning some games consecutively in the MAC or show up on defense. Number seven, Western Michigan. I think they're coming. Uh, I have them right behind Ohio. John was cynic. Another good performance at the quarterback position for Tim Lester and the Broncos. Uh, A very good run game there as well. Very underrated. Number eight, Ball State. Number nine, Miami. Ten, Kent State, who Ohio will be playing this weekend. Eleven, Bowling Green. And number 12, Central Michigan, John Bonamago's team. Really, uh, after a good season last year, which saw them make a bowl appearance, really disappointing. Their only win so far is 17-5 to barn burner over Mm -hmm. the main Black Bears. Now, are you familiar with uh, with Bet Your House, sir? Oh, isn't everybody familiar with Bet Your House? I, I think it's the most popular segment in all sports talk. Yeah, it is, but some people, believe it or not, are still out there and unfamiliar, which shame on them <laughs> for not being familiar with Bet Your House. If you're new to the program, Bet Your House is a segment in which I encourage viewers to legally, legally go out and bet their house on a Mid-American Conference football game. Last two weeks, we have missed. Last uh, Two weeks ago, I had Eastern Michigan minus – no, I had East, uh, Eastern Michigan plus 13.5 on the road. They blew that one. And then last week, I had Kent State plus 7.5 on the road, um, ultimately getting blown out by Ball State, Riley Moore. Had a huge passing game in that one, 400-plus yards. I'm going to pick another team on the road, but this time it's a favorite. I'm going to go with Northern Illinois, minus three at Ball State. Yes, I'm betting against Ball State again. Northern Illinois, I like the direction this program is going. Marcus Childers, uh, Mac freshman of the year last year, a guy who has been in the discussion for Mac player uh, Offensive Player of the Week awards so far. Sutton Smith, a guy you're going to see getting drafted in the first half of the draft from North Illinois, a guy who I could see going in a, in the first round if he really plays well for the remainder of this year. I think they get it done with ease on the road in Muncie, and I think that's in large part due to their defense. Give me North Illinois minus three. Bet your house on it. We've had our house repossessed two weeks in a row, so we really need – to win our house back. Right now, we're homeless. We're two up, we're two down. So we have zero houses. So this shouldn't really even be here. But next week, we're going to have a house. 
bet your mansion. I'm very confident this week. I haven't been as confident the last two weeks, to be honest, which kind of negates the purpose of bet your house. But nonetheless, this week, I am extremely confident. Bet your house. Get out several mortgages. Gamble them on Northern Illinois minus three at Ball State. Real quick, something we need to talk about in the world of sports the biggest fight in UFC history going down this week, and the notorious Conor McGregor and the Eagle Khabib Nurmagomedov fighting at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's impossible for me to say who I think is going to win this fight, so I'm going to ask you. Oh, no, I can tell you who's going to win this fight. Listen, if I had a Bet Your House segment, yeah, you I'd do. put you do. all my money on the notorious Conor McGregor. He's been there before. He's been in the big fight. He's been under the big lights. He's been in every situation. Listen to what he says. Listen to his confidence. This man does not sound like a guy who is going to lose on Saturday night. Make sure you tune in and make sure you buy it. It is going to be amazing. But can he wrestle? We're going to find out. He certainly held his ground in the Mendez fight. He's going to be wrestling his knuckle out of his orbital bone. (laughs) That may be very true. The best takedown is that clean left hand. That's all the time we have here on Ohio Sports Center this week. We want to thank you for joining us. Thanks, Max, for coming on. Hopefully more explosive and transformational sports content coming ahead in the future. Leave us a like, leave us a comment, throw us a share. Uh, maybe leave us the, the laughy face emoji, maybe the heart one, if you think we did an exceptional job. This is Ohio Sports Ed.